Okay. So let's let's kind of go over where we're at in terms of the assignment and the big ideas. So I'm on. The kind of like the, the, the mother of all equations is this one right here. So this gives you the gravitational force between any two objects. The only thing you need to know is mass and how far apart they are. Okay? So, so if you look on like problem number two, okay? So in problem number two, there's two ways you can do problem number two depending upon the scale that you want to look at. It says, at what center to center distance from the Earth would a one kilogram mass weigh three newtons? So here's the two approaches you can take. And it's important that you understand how both of these work. So one option is that you start with this equation. Okay? The three newtons represents the gravitational force between those two objects. That's it. That is the force. That's the three newtons. Okay? That's it. Then, you know, that's going to be big G. You've got the mass of the Earth. You've got the one kilogram mass and distance squared. Okay? Because fundamentally, that's what the three Newtons represents. That is the force between those two objects. One of them is the mass of the Earth. The other one's one kilogram mass. Boom. Solve for D. Okay? Your answer should be something times 10 to the 7. Okay? So your answer to number 2 should be something times 10 to the 7. Now, here's the other side of this coin. Okay? The only way a 1 kilogram mass can weigh 3 newtons is if G has a value of 3 meters per second squared. Okay? That's the only way it can happen is if the gravitational acceleration is 3 meters per second squared. Oh, now I know what little g is. So the other option is that you use little g equals big G mass of the Earth over r squared. You know what little g is, boom, that's going to be your 3 meters per second squared. You know the mass of the Earth, because that's what it's falling towards. You know what big G is, you solve for r. Either way, you're going to get the same answer, okay? So it's important that you understand when you look at that mother of all equations, F equals big G M1 M2 over D squared. That rules everything else because everything else comes from that one idea. Okay. When you get to 5 and 6, okay, and this will play out with the moon later on. So on 5 and 6, what we're saying is that here's the moon, here's the lunar command module, and you're told that this thing is 72.0 kilometers above the moon, and you're given the radius of the moon, which was 1738 kilometers. So you want to calculate the speed, and then you want to calculate the orbital period. So here's what's going to be important on this one. So you're going to use that V equals big G M over R and the square root of that. Okay? It's pretty straightforward. As long as you know which radius to use. So am I going to use the 72? Am I going to use the 1738? Or am I going to add the two together? Luke. Hmm? Which radius am I going to use? <coughs> the 72, the 1738, or am, I to, or am I going to add the two values together? Because uh, it has to be measured from the center to center distance. Connor M, am I going to use that? Am I going to leave that in kilometers? No. What do I have to convert it into? Mm -hmm. Meters, absolutely. As soon as you see anything involving big G, that is like the poster child that says, hey, we got to use, we got to be meters, kilograms, seconds. So oddly enough, your answer to number five, your velocity, 
should be something times 10 to the third, just what we talked about. The orbital period in seconds on number six should also be 10 to the third, okay? So that's why I said, when you look at these answers, if you don't get that, oh, I got 10 to the fifth. Oh, Burkamp doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm right. I got 10 to the fifth. Promise you, you are wrong, okay? If you don't get 10 to the third for that velocity and 10 to the third for that orbital period, you have done something wrong, okay? You forgot to take the square root. You forgot to cube something. Something has gone south. Okay. We'll get to number seven after I do a visual, but we'll, we'll circle back to number seven. So when you get to number eight, so on number eight, you're going to start with what I call the Swiss Army Knife Equation. That four pi squared <coughs> R cubed equals big G M T squared. So we're going to talk about this in, in just a second. So like I said, this is what I call the Swiss Army Knife Equation. You can look at radius, you can look at mass, you can look at period. Okay, those are all three variables in there. So what you want to do on number eight, you're going to try and find the mass of Saturn. And again, this is what we do to find the mass of these planets. We don't, well, number one, you couldn't even weigh Saturn. Saturn is actually less dense than water. If you could take Saturn and put it in a bathtub, Saturn would actually float in a bathtub if you had a big enough bathtub. Because Saturn overall is less dense than water. So we couldn't even like put it on a scale. It isn't like it's a solid object anyway. So what we do is we make observations. We look at the moons that orbit them. So if we can figure out the orbital radius and the orbital period of a moon, we can find the mass of the planet that's at the center of that. So let's say we lose track, the internet crashes, we have to reconstruct the mass of the Earth. Cool, we can do that. We've got a moon. Okay, moon takes about 30 days to complete one orbit, so we know the value of T. If we knew how far away the moon was, we could figure out and work backwards and get the mass of our Earth if we didn't have that number. So if we needed to reconstruct it, because we have a moon, we could just do this. Cool. But again, any time you see big G, it is you have to absolutely, without fail, be in the MKS system. So, your answer to number 8 should be something times 10 to the 26th. Okay? Something times 10 to the 26th. Now, when you get to number 9. So, number 9 and this parking lot of geosynchronous orbits, satellites. Whoa. It's just been doing this weird thing like all day, like I drive, and then it just like disappears. <coughs> okay, so we've got this parking lot of geosynchronous orbit satellites. Geosynchronous means that it's above the same point all the time. So again, you're going to go back to that Swiss Army knife equation: four pi squared r cubed big G. You know the orbital period, but what you don't know is the radius. Scooter Mew, what are you going to have to do with the 24 hours? Make it into seconds. Beautiful. you got to make that into seconds. So, now, when you look at question number nine, in big, bold letters, I tell you how high above the surface of the Earth be. So, when you get this number out of the equation, that's measured from the center of the Earth out to that point, which works because we're treating the satellite and the Earth as a point mass, okay? That's why that works, because we're treating them as point masses. Now, functionally, when you drive, you're not at the center of the Earth, which would be really awkward. You are at the surface of the Earth. That's where your interaction is. You've got your cell phone, oh, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to get to Brahms in Oklahoma City. Punch that in. So your phone starts communicating 
with these geosynchronous satellites. So the distance that your phone, that signal has to travel, <coughs> is based upon the surface of the Earth, not the center of the Earth. So if all goes well on 9A, after, after you subtract out the radius of the Earth, that should be something times 10 to the 7th. Okay? Now, the reason that I put 9B on there, and I did the same thing on number 10, is that it's tough to grasp scale when you're talking about space, okay? Because everybody has this idea, oh, in space, you're like, oh, you're so far from the Earth, all right? Now, so I did this as a, this is why I picked Kansas City to Wichita, because you all kind of have a visual of like what that looks like. Okay, oh yeah, we can drive to Kansas City, pretty easy drive, okay? You can make that drive. So basically what we're saying on that one is that I want you to make a comparison of the distance from Kansas City to Wichita to the distance to a geosynchronous orbit. So what you should see on 9B that it's a little over 100 times greater, okay? But for satellites, that's a long way out there, okay? Most satellites aren't that far because we don't need to boost them in that high of orbit because that costs a lot of money, okay? To boost that satellite that far out when all in reality, all you have to do, if this is the scale, all you have to do is get it about a half inch above the surface of the Earth, okay? That's all you have to do. You don't need to be way out here. You just have to get it outside of our atmosphere so you don't have the drag in the interaction with our atmosphere. Okay, then on nine, you're gonna take the distance that that has to travel and divide it by the speed of light. And that should be around 0.1 seconds, okay? So 0.1 seconds is about how long it takes to snap your fingers. So this is why your phone is able to stay updated and pretty much show you exactly where you're at without much lag. So that signal, takes 0.1 seconds to go from your phone to the satellite and another 0.1 seconds for that signal to come back. So that's like that. So in that amount of time, your phone has sent a signal to the satellite and come back. That's why you can have such accurate representation of where you are when you're using the GPS maps because that's all it takes, that, boom, boom. Signal goes out, signal comes back. That's, what, now, it would be much different if there was like a minute lag. If that took like a minute, oh, you'd, it would take a minute for it to get there and then it would take a minute to get back, okay? Your mapping features would not work near as well because there would be such a time lag in the signal bouncing back and forth. It'd be like me talking and you would see my lips move but let's say the speed of sound was really, really slow, thank God it isn't. But if the speed of sound is really, really slow, like you'd see my lips move, and then you'd hear my voice like, you know, 10 seconds later. Like, you'd see me shut up, and like, I'm not talking. And then 10 seconds later, then you'd hear me say, I'm not talking, which would be really, really weird. So, thankfully that doesn't help. Now, in contrast to number 10. So number 10, you're talking about the International Space Station. <coughs> So that one's much closer. So once you subtract out the radius of the Earth, your answer to 10a should be something times 10 to the fifth, okay? So on this one, and again, this is why I picked this distance. On number 10b, the distance from Wichita to Kansas City is actually bigger than the distance from us to the International Space Station, if it's directly over there. So, that's why I picked that. It's like, oh yeah, right. That uh, seems like a long way out. It's closer than it is to Kansas City when it's directly overhead. So it isn't like way, way, way out there. It's like, no, we we'll just have to get a bullet out of this Okay. Um, when you get to number 12, keep in mind that that is a square root function for the velocity of an object. So I'm just telling you that. Keep in mind that's a square root function. Um, on 13, 
you're, you're, what they were, the whole po point of question number 13 is that you're trying to figure out is gravity providing enough force between the nucleus and an electron to hold it in orbit like the sun holds the earth in orbit around <coughs> as it goes. And it's woefully inadequate, okay? Your, your answer to 9a is like 10 to the negative 47th, okay? It's an extremely... 13a? 13 13a. Uh, 13 13 <laughs> what did I say? 9a. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. My bad. My bad. 13a is 10 to the negative 47, okay? An extremely, 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 extremely small gravitational force between the proton and the electron. The electrostatic force is <coughs> exponentially times greater. Okay? Cool with that. So now, when we go to the back, I'm going to show you a visual on how that Lagrange point question is going to work out. So stop, you have the camera, bring that.